in, everyone. I officially call this meeting to order. And I believe uh, Chris is sharing his screen. We are here to engage in a community-led process that we believe can lead to meaningful recommendations for reform and alternatives to policing in our community. Um, so now there will be a Spanish translation. Um, so just allow about 15 seconds um, for the translation to take place. Okay, so just some webinar information. If you were nominated to serve on this committee by an organization, you should have received an invitation to be a panelist. If you sign in with the email that was sent to you, it should set automatically. If for some reason you were not automatically set up as a panelist or were nominated, you will be prompted. Please pay attention to your screen to accept the promotion to panelist as it requires you to accept the promotion. And then regarding accessibility, if you have any other suggestions on how to make this meeting more accessible, please email Chris Logan at Christopher L at Sacred Heart CS.org. And this is our land acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge that we host this meeting on the lands of the Lekma Ulam people who have stewarded this land through the generations. We commit ourselves to partner with our indigenous sisters and brothers to celebrate and honor their legacy in our collective work for justice and our care for these lands we benefit from today. And now we'll begin our presentation for today. Just one moment as we get the presentation set up on the screen. Okay, so this presentation is titled San Jose is Anti Black. Presentation by myself, Olivia Foster, Carmen Brammer, Derek Sanderlin. Mara Hall, who won't be able to participate today, and Kiana Simmons. And it'll be about the Black experience, um, from our experience here in San Jose. Um, we'll have an opportunity to hear um, from those who have lived experiences here in San Jose with the police, um, as well as um, give a presentation involving some statistics, um, some recommendations, and also have time uh, for, for discussion with you all at the end. Um, so we're excited to, to present to you today. We can get started. Wait, don't press play just yet, sorry. Hi everyone, my name is Kiana Simmons and um, I will be giving uh, some of my lived experience testimony on uh, my experience with SJPD. Um, so I'd like to read a little bit about um, who I was and, and my experience um, getting started in this, this movement. So like I mentioned before, my name is Kiana. Um, before the George Floyd protests and, and the pandemic, I was a normal community member. I spent my time between work and just going to the beach, pretty normal activity. I was not a part of any organization um, and I had never been particularly interested in policy. Um, everything for, for me changed when George Floyd was murdered uh, by police officer Derek Chauvin on May 29th. 2020, I joined the hundreds of others who went to protest in front of San Jose Hall um, in advocate, uh, advocating for George Floyd and the protection of Black lives. This was the first protest I had ever been to. I was intimidated by a lot of things. Um, there were a, a large number of people who were there 
they were all wearing their emotions. Um, a lot of people were crying. Um, there are other people who were playing music. Um, some people had signs and I, I even made some signs as well um, in defense of George Floyd and um, the movement overall. There were not only um, the, pol the people, but there were the police. Um, there were multiple law enforcement agencies, not even just SJPD, but of course SJPD was there um, in, in the hundreds. They were all over um, downtown. They had a row of officers in front of City Hall just staring at the protesters. Um, they had their batons ready. I'll get, I'll get into more, more into that later. Um, but um, yeah, they, they were wearing full body armor, uh, holding batons, rubber bullets, um, and they had actual bullets on them as well. Um, in addition to uh, the physical threat of the officers and also knowing that there were multiple different policing agencies, there were literal tanks in the middle of the street, like tanks that you see um, the military use. And these were just in the middle of, uh, of Santa Clara and 4th Street. Um, and then in, in addition to all of that imagery that I, I'm trying to, to say, is like there's, there's the police, there's the protesters, there's a lot of moving parts. Um, like I mentioned, people were crying, people were being very emotional. And there's there you can see a, a people, a crowd of people sitting or kneeling or standing um, and directly looking at these officers as uh, kind of like a, like they're, they're watching us, we're watching you. And that was the imagery of, of the first few days of the San Jose protest. San Jose is anti-Black. What does that mean? Um, there's a history of racist policy that over the years that has folks, black folks to leave and, and prevented black folk from buying houses. San Jose is anti-black because of the constant rhetoric that some politicians use when talking about Black Lives Matter, the police uh, crime rates, and using known dog whistles to further neglect change when it comes to policing. We'll also get more into that throughout the presentation. The immediate and only response the city of San Jose had to the murder of George Floyd was to send the police and other law enforcement agencies to be a physical reminder of the state sanctioned oppression that has always existed for those in defiance of black lives. May 29th, 2020 was the first time I feared for my safety and it was because of the San Jose Police Department. And I want to give you a glimpse into what I experienced. In May 29th, in the days immediately following, um, I prepared a short video, uh, a video comp compil compilation of what I experienced. So I'm going to show that in the next slide, but I just wanted to outline what is what is what you were going to see in those videos. So the first video, you'll see me and a few hundred other people at San Jose City Hall uh, running. Uh, this happened around 7 p.m. We're running uh, scattered. You can see people trying to take cover as SJPD fires into the crowd. They throw uh, what appears to be flash grenades. I'm not even too sure if that's what it is, but they throw them and they explode on the ground like fireworks. Um, and then at the same time, they were shooting into the crowd with rubber bullets and uh, tear gas. Um, earlier in that crowd, uh, there were families there um, with, with their children. And of course, me there as well. And this happened the first day of my experience in protesting. And the first Deanna. thing- Tiana, this is Sparky. Are you actually sharing a video right now? No, but I will be sharing. Oh, okay. Because I was saying I'm not seeing anything but a blank square. Yes, I will be sharing the video in just a second. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that that's the first video that you'll see. Um, the second video, you can see the number of police officers, including the tanks, um, the unre unreasonable, unjustifiable amount of uh, police officers who were there. Um, and the, there's another video that shows uh, SJPD on motorcycles. There were about 20 motorcycle officers chasing people through the seats of the streets of San Jose. I was one of those people um, after they had like essentially bombed City Hall. Um, people like fled. They were trying to leave and the police followed those people. They followed me. Um, and like I mentioned, I came, uh, I don't know if I mentioned this, but I did come to these protests alone. I didn't know anyone who would go with me. Um, at first. So I was just running with people I had never met before. And I was just scared to be alone in that, that scenario. 
So we're running through the streets. Um, and then after that, you see a video. Um, it's from a different angle. I climb the um, garage on 4th Street and I'm looking at, at 4th Street and like there's apartments there. This is near the MLK library and there are protesters near MLK and then there are a, a line of police officers um, where City Hall is, so on, just on the other side of the street. And they're firing, um, like they're firing tear gas, rubber bullets, and these, I don't know, again, I don't know if they're called flash grenades, but that's what I'm assuming that they are, um, into the crowd and into the middle of the street. Um, and there's lots of videos of that. Um, and I was really surprised. And that's also where I was tear gassed by SJPD, um, by observing uh, what they were doing from the garage. Um, I got tear gassed um, while recording those videos. So without further ado, I want to show you the small video comp compilation that I, I made. Hit that nice car too. <laughs> so after um, that last video, they swarmed SJPD swarmed the parking garage that I was in. Um, and like I mentioned, I had been tear gassed, so I could barely see. And I have asthma, so it was really difficult for me to breathe. Um, but they let me go, and I had, my phone had actually died, so uh, I didn't feel protected in any way of being alone in the parking garage with a dead phone and not being able to, to breathe or see. So um, I just left. And um, I was obviously traumatized from all of that, as I'm sure everyone who was at those protests um, or who witnessed um, these events were as well. Um, and after this experience, I became determined to stay involved in this movement of um, defunding the police and, and looking into San Jose PD specifically. Um, I felt that their behavior was unacceptable. I still feel like their behavior is completely unacceptable. Um, it put a lot of people in danger and a lot of people were physically harmed um, for just participating in these protests. And um, anyway, I started a, an organization uh, myself um, in response to this and I organized with other members in the community to, to look at SJPD to monitor what they do and to look at the statistics um, and reimagine a, a community where we can feel safe. Um, and ever since then, ever since my involvement uh, doing that kind of work, I have 
uh, I have not been directly arrested by SJPD, but I have witnessed multiple arrests on other community members. And all of those events were similarly traumatizing. Um, the first arrest that I was there for was outside of, it was after one of the protests. Um, and then also just, just for protection, I'm not gonna give a lot of details here, but it was, it was after one of the protests and um, me and a few other people were um, just really just chilling in some grass, sitting down, just kind of taking a breath after um, that moment. And suddenly around 10 uh, police officers, like 10 squad cars pull up and just, just on both sides of the street. Um, officers get out of the car. The first officer walks up to us and says, shut the fuck up. Um, and then we hadn't said anything, uh, but he, he said that. And he picks up one of my friends and uh, they, take, they take that person away. And eventually that person comes back. And what they told me was that SPD had taken them to uh, the parking uh, the parking lot on, um, I think it's 10th Street, like next to SJSU where that new house was just moved, uh, like that Victorian house. Um, so they took them to that parking lot. This was before the house was moved. So it's like pretty much empty. And SJPD interrogated uh, this person and um, at, during, in the parking lot, um, which I suppose is detaining them, but also where what is the civil rights uh, with that situation? So um, my friend was like, I don't have to give you any information. And they said, oh, if you give us your name, we'll drop you back off to where we got you from. And that my, my friend said no. And so they made that person walk back to where um, we were hanging out before. And um, obviously that is awful and traumatizing. And then the second arrest experience that I wanted to talk about was the one that you see here. Um, so um, SJPD ar uh, arrested someone, one of my comrades for um, allegedly uh, vandalizing the mayor's house. Um, and that's a vandalism charge. That's a, that's a vandalism charge. Uh, crime that they were that they were um, saying. And I, I also understand that a lot of this isn't just SJPD, it's also the DA, which is just the carceral system in general, right? They all work together hand in hand to create these oppressive systems and traumatize people. But um, yeah, anyway, uh, for this arrest, they went to this person's house. Uh, they had a helicopter. They worked with not only, uh, it was not only SJPD, but they also worked with Santa Clara PD. And there were multiple officers in front of this person's house. They closed off the entire street. Um, they had guns pointed at the house. They had it on uh, an announcement saying that, like, come out with your hands up. Um, extremely traumatizing for an alleged vandalism charge that the charges were later dropped for. And also, uh, the police they didn't have a normal warrant to even do that. They had to get a Remy warrant. And I won't get into the specifics of that, but um, I do believe that SJPD, they did that display on purpose um, to purposely intimidate um, those who stand up against them. And, and like I mentioned, the, the charges were dropped because they were bullshit to begin with. Sorry, excuse me. But um, that's that's what we are. That's what we live with. And, and you can ask anyone who has been organizing in San Jose for a long time. SJPD has a habit of, of doing this and treating other activists like this. Um, and I just want to finish up by saying a few more things on my experience with SJPD. Um, I've had SJPD officers uh, harass me online. Um, they use fake accounts, obviously, but I know that they're police officers. Um, anytime I go on the live stream uh, or like live stream anything, there's a bunch of uh, weird accounts uh, giving commentary. Um, that happens a lot. And, and even one time, the San Jose PD officially, they logged onto our live stream. I have a screenshot of that somewhere, but they have done that as well. Um, and the last thing I want to speak to is that a few months ago, um, I met with some Black police officers to talk about just the experience of being a citizen um, and, and a police officer who who are black and like what that experience is like and, and see, trying to see the nuance there. Um, and I was encouraged to go on a ride along and try to understand things a little bit from their point of view. And I thought about it for a long time and then I eventually did say, yes, I want to go on this ride along. And um, when I filed, like when I submitted my application for it, um, it took Chief Mata to actually approve it, which I don't think is normal procedure 
Um, and when I eventually got on the ride along with this, this person, this officer, um, he was telling me that he was really surprised that I actually took him up on his offer and that the entire department was talking about it and that they said that I was a terrorist and that I hate police and um, all of these other things that just made assumptions about who I was. Um, they obviously couldn't deny my request to go on the ride along. I don't have any priors. Um, I'm not uh, being suspected of, of any crimes to my knowledge at least. So I, I could, I, there was no reason to deny me this ride along opportunity. But when I was there, um, it became really clear that SJPD, um, the entire department apparently knows about the work that I do. Um, and they, they felt some type of way before they had even met me or before, or, in, or limiting my options to interact with them just because of what they've heard and what, what they think um, because of the work that I do. And that's, that's not right to me. Um, that has to be in violation of some like laws. But that's where I'm going to end my lived experience testimony. Derek will be on in a moment to continue our presentation. Hey everyone, so I really appreciate the words of Kiana. I thought that was a helpful primer uh, looking at the today. Um, and right now I want to take us back into some uh, other instances in which we've seen uh, the powerful and elite um, use messaging uh, and, and money um, to perpetuate uh, a system of white supremacy here in the city of San Jose. Um, so of course we can talk about, again, the modern, um, uh, and again, my name is Derek, uh, he, they, and I work for Sacred Heart. Um, the rhetoric of politicians and city council members had been a lot of like fear mongering, um, mostly, uh, comments about uh, defunding the police and democratic processes. Um, there was, uh, of course, the uh, racist political ads that have been put out against uh, Silvia Arenas um, back in 2018, I think. And, uh, and then again in 2020 against uh, the uh, uh, candidate for Dis District 6, Jake Tonkel. Um, uh, a lot of folks who are uh, a part of this RIPS process um, and, and walked out in solidarity uh, also showed a lot of power at the time in, in response to this racist ad uh, that was put out. Um, I uh, wanted to, of course, dive a little bit into um, the perpetuation of white supremacy within the institution of the police department here in San Jose. Uh, I don't know, Carmen, if you wanted to add anything to this particular slide or if it's okay if I move on. Uh, no, I'm, I'm good because I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the, um, the political stuff in my, on my slide. So feel free okay. to go ahead and thanks for asking. Yeah, not a problem. So uh, I'm gonna take us back now even further and then we'll come back to the present a little bit just a little bit of a time warp uh if you will um again this is just history that uh that we have been pulling up um from from the past we believe that we cannot uh 
we can we are doomed to repeat history if we do not learn from it um and so uh it is the reason why i'm sharing uh our heritage uh here in this city with you today uh so back in the 60s the john birch society a national far-right Christian group known to be a precursor to QAnon was actively and publicly against community-led police accountability measures back in 1966. Uh, after meeting with local organizations that were directly connected to this group, uh, one Sergeant Lee Brown began writing articles uh, in the uh, POA's Vanguard and also Police Magazine uh, suggesting that challenges to police, um, specifically charges of police brutality and harassment, were rooted in the malicious efforts of communists. Um, this led to, obviously, the direct surveillance of, of certain folks who were uh, fighting for police accountability as early as uh, 1966, but likely much, much, much before that. Uh, and in the next slide, if you could, uh, again, a little bit of a time warp. Uh, you could see some of the local police culture uh, in the modern, uh, where some police officers were essentially caught uh, having racist conversations, um, mocking Muslims uh, and BLM protesters. Uh, I don't know, mocking doesn't really seem like quite the right word, uh, mentions of using a woman's hijab in a violent manner um, as a noose. Um, and then uh, another, where is it here? Uh, okay, so, uh, right. So at the same time, it, there's this uh, complaint that was circulating around Officer Nabil Haidar. Um, one of their own who was openly mocked for almost two decades and called terrible names that I won't care to repeat, repeat in this in this setting. Um, and one high ranking officer at the time, uh, who is currently the chief of police, uh, laughed and joined in allegedly. Um, and another uh, who is currently the supervising sergeant for San Jose High School, um, publicly denounced the racist Facebook posts and promised to hold them accountable. And then later told his fellow officers, we tried to pull back the message, but it was too late. Uh, he apologized essentially for uh, promising to hold cops accountable for racist rhetoric being used on or off the job. Um, and if you could share the next slide here. This final one is just uh, some broader context um, in the city of San Jose. Um, of course, we have things like uh, redlining and gentrification, um, and we saw the decline of the Black population in places like Little Egypt, in uh, which was a Black neighborhood on the east side. Um, but I, I think that there's a lot of information out there already that's been shared with the city um, and so I encourage you to look at those things. I want to focus on two particular things today. Uh, one is a that repeating history that I mentioned. And uh, the second is uh, the project crackdown, um, which happened in 96. Uh, again, a bit of a time warp. So thank you for uh, sitting with me uh, through this through this history lesson. Um, so in san jose uh labor groups and the local cso chapter had been decrying police brutality uh and officer involved shootings since the depression era actually um and you know rest in peace frank alvarez in light of that um so when the watts uprisings gained national attention in 1965 a series of uh dialogues between the community and police began in order to find ways to prevent what happened in Watts from happening here. Uh, they demanded the establishment of a police review board uh, to serve as a mechanism through which uh, officers who brutalized citizens could be held accountable. An advisory board was created instead, which the San Jose Police Officers Association ensured that the board would be 
be stripped completely of its power. In light of this, uh, community representatives walked out of the next meeting to protest what they believed was a betrayal by the police. Uh, community organizers eventually started a new committee that would pursue a real review board, um, but that eventually died out due to nuanced political differences between liberal and more radical left groups. Uh, so there is uh, a lot of maneuvering that happens in between um, with the Sergeant uh, Lee Brown that sort of uh, and, and the San Jose Police Officers Association that sort of uh, derails this process from being something where a uh, community can hold uh, officers to account to uh, almost creating rules for uh, rules of engagement for protests um, without any community engagement in the process. Um, I, I highlight this story because there's a lot here that I think a lot of us can learn. Um, it probably sounds very familiar to what has been happening over the last year and a half, uh, which is a big message um, that if you want the change, um, then we have to learn from the past. Um, the second thing that I wanted to bring up here is just uh, Project Crackdown. Um, which sort of highlights some of the uh, more direct policies uh, that have alienated black communities. Um, so the Mercury News reported in 1996 that Project Crackdown was a neighborhood revitaliz revitalization program in San Jose um, and encouraged landlords to sign a neighborhood improvement agreement to help clean up areas overcome with gangs, uh, drugs, and blight. One landlord in the area said, uh, we can get a better clientele through uh, Project Crackdown's revitalization efforts, potentially raising rent prices by at least $300. Um, under the agreement, tenants were, were reportedly obligated to follow a series of house rules that prohibit the use of drugs, forbid laundry from being hung outdoors, allow parking only where permitted, and bar the use of carports as storage areas uh, and require landlords to be notified promptly of problems such as broken fences or appliances. Uh, however, the report stated that most tenants in the area had not been consulted about the agreement and failure to abide by house rules uh, subjects them to citations from city inspectors or even worse, eviction at the discretion of their landlord. Uh, the community coordinator who now represents the San Jose Police Officers Association uh, said uh, the only way we can win in that area is to get the property owners together uh, and get them to agree to some standards. It takes four of five ne neglected properties to bring a neighborhood down. Pretty soon, everybody starts lowering their standards. Uh, Later on in, in September uh, of last year, a report was put out uh, saying, stating uh, it was by Dr. Amanda Boston, who stated uh, that neighborhood revitalization actually leads to displacement and destabilization in our neighborhoods. Uh, and that's kind of the basic point I wanted to bring here, um, because a lot of people will uh, try to utilize like, um, like some of the more egregious things that happen, some of the more physically visceral uh, uh, things that happen in our city. Um, but there are also very subtle ways that black communities in particular have been marginalized and oppressed. Uh, and it comes in subtle ways as, as such as being cited for not being wealthy enough to have space in your home for a laundry line. Um, and that can that can cause that can cause uh, concern with your landlord and cause you a citation or get you evicted back in the 90s, um, which wasn't so long ago. And so I want I wanted to uh, share that history in the hopes that um, as we continue pushing for something new in this city, uh, that we know what has been done in the past and and who was involved 
and what we can do differently. So thank you for hearing me out. Uh, I think I'm passing it on to uh, Carmen, who's going to share some stats with y'all. Thanks, Derek. Uh, my name is Carmen Brammer, and I am the elder of uh, the team that's doing this presentation. And I do want to say thank you to both Kiana and Derek for the um, information that they provided. I'm actually learning a lot from it, too. So as the elder of the team, I've lived in District 8 for over 35 years. I've raised a child in this city. And over time, I've seen the decline of people who look like me in my neighborhood. So right now on the slide, you can see that currently our population, the Black population in San Jose is 3% yet we represent 19% of the unhoused people. Um, in California, 74% of black students don't believe that police make them feel safer. And then uh, uh, number three, which talks about how many more times African-Americans, blacks are more likely to be stopped by the police for an infraction. And I'll go into those in a little bit more detail. And the last item talks about a recent statistics which shared that over the past five years, no San Jose police officer has been prosecuted for killing someone despite 19 fatal encounters with the police. And 15 of these encounters were people of color. And that makes San Jose number one in the Bay Area for fatal encounters with the police. And that the, these numbers are astounding. So for me personally, as Kiana had her story, I'm gonna share my story as I, share, as I mentioned earlier, I've been here a long-term resident. And I have not been involved in a lot of the political stuff. I really thought San Jose was a very diverse and inclusive community. But as, as I share over time, I'm seeing that that's just not happening. And in 2020 was the first year that I actually hated, and I have to use that word, living in San Jose, something I never thought I would ever, ever feel. And this occurred when I saw what happened at the George Floyd rally in downtown San Jose in 2020, where police brutally attacking the crowd, causing serious injuries to folks, including one of our panel members, Derek Sanderlin. He is the same individual who had provided anti-bias training to them. I was shocked and could not believe that this happened in our city. I had participated in the annual women's marches during the Trump years and did not hear or see any level of violent reaction from the police to these events. Then to top it off, towards the end of 2020, during the election cycle, Silicon Valley organization, now the San Jose Chamber, ran a racist ad for city council member Deb Davis's 2020 campaign, depicting blacks rioting in South Africa against apartheid and had the utter gall to indicate that if Deb's opponent one, Blacks in San Jose would be out on the streets destroying everything because Jake Tonkel supported defunding the police. This ad and the racism behind it struck me to my core and has left a hurt, and I don't think folks understand just how much that hurt, so deep that I continue to be traumatized to this day. And then just recently, I see, whoop, our slides are gone, but I'll continue speaking. Recently, I saw that Matt Mahan, he's a city council member who's currently running for mayor, is using the phrase defund the, pol defund the police in his campaign information. By using these dog whistles to rile up his supporters, Mahan is knowingly ignoring its impact. I am again reminded of SVO. San Jose Chamber's races at, and other times that I've heard other local politicians, including Mayor Licardo, use divisive rhetoric that influences how others, including the police, view Black people. To quote Jeff Moore, who is the former president of the San Jose Silicon Valley NAACP, and he relocated to Georgia in the summer of 2021, he said, the city council plays games when people's lives are being affected. They're destroying communities and traditions. The other thing that happened is in 2021, the Silicon Valley Pain Index uh, was published and it shared a staggering statistic on how black adults are treated by the police. According to the 2021 census, as I shared, blacks are only 3% of the city's population, yet 
Black adults are 6.6 .6 times more likely to be stopped by the San Jose Police Department and given a local infraction as a result of a non-traffic stop than white adults. These numbers make it hard for me to feel safe in San Jose. When I'm driving and I see a police car on the road, my whole demeanor changes. There's a consistent fear of being pulled over for no reason, just because they can, and I'm a black woman. And then I'll turn it over. So thank you for letting me have this opportunity to share my lived experience. And due to this experience, I have become much more involved politically. I've gotten involved in a lot of community-based organizations. Um, I'm, a mem I'm an active member of the Black Leadership Kitchen Cabinet. I'm an me active member of the um, Showing Up for Racial Justice South County. I'm also a member of Solidarity Sundays, and these are all organizations that are here to for supporting of social and racial justice. Thank you, Carmen and Derek. Um, Chris, can you please go to slide nine? Uh, just skip skip the slide in the middle. Um, I don't. Oh, I'm so sorry. I don't know if you guys can see that very well. Um, but I just wanted to go over some some st some statistics really quickly. This is from the 2020 research uh, study on um, crime statistics. Unfortunately, um, nationally there has not been an update on crime convictions since 20 uh, sorry 2006, which is ridiculous to me. Um, so these are not the most updated statistics, um, but it is what is currently available. Um, and I apologize that, you, that they're a little small. Um, but table one, uh, the top left um, graph shows uh, the percentage of crimes reported to the police. Um, the last, in, in total in 2018, which is the last uh, time that this statistic was gathered, was that um, there's like a total of 49% of crimes being reported, but it is actually estimated that that number is only half, that um, literally half of crimes are not reported for various reasons. Um, but, you know, in my case, I, I probably wouldn't report a crime because I don't trust the police. Um, the second table on the bottom is the percent of crime uh, where police make arrests. And um, I can't even read the most recent one, honestly, I'm sorry about that. But my point with this is to bring up that um, whatever the number is for the percent of crimes that police make arrests on, that number, is not entirely accurate and it is expected to double should police self-report the crimes that they inflict on others and this includes sexual assault and harassment um and uh physical harassment and brutality uh that SJPD or uh, police in general um across the nation um commit on other people and then the third graph here is the conviction rate of those crimes right because one you're not um guilty of a crime if you are arrested, first of all. Second of all, if you do get convicted of that crime, um, let's look at the national numbers on that. And the total for the entire country is less than 2% of conviction. That means policing is incredibly ineffective, is basically what this slide is saying. Um, and um, you know, I, I do believe that to, to be true. And with the number um, of the 2% conviction rate, it is important to note as well that there are false convictions all the time and estimated between five and 10% of false convictions. So just because someone is convicted, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are guilty of that crime. Um, in addition to that, policing does not solve crime. Um, and, and no instances uh, throughout history have policing been, uh, policing does not reduce crime. It's just a response to crime. Um, and with that mindset, we'll never get ahead of the problem. But that is what, that's just what I wanted to say here. So I'm going to pass. Okay, so where do we go from here? Um, now I just wanna you know, go through some recommendations um, with you all. And the first one is communal governance. You know, I, we believe a, a community oversight commission is needed in our community. Um, and as we know, the, for example, the Charter Review Commission, they've put forth um, or that such a recommendation, um, but we cannot just accept it going to council and potentially that's all that happens and nothing comes of it. We need to, to actively you know, voice 
you know, where we stand on that. Because having such a commission, it allows us as the community, as residents, to really, you know, have a say in what happens in our lives. And as we see injustices take place, it should be our right to, to say, you know, what's right versus what's wrong, to, to give sh suggestions that are taken seriously, to, to really make change in our community so we can all feel safe um, as we walk our streets, so we can all stay safe if we, you know, if we want to use our right to protest. We, we absolutely need this, and we, all of our voices need to be heard, um, especially when it comes to voting on this item. And if we need to put out additional recommendations on creating a, an oversight commission, we have to do that. We can't just sit back and, and wait for it, for it to die and, and not do anything about it. Um, so I encourage everyone on here to, you know, as it comes time to vote, when it comes time to make recommendations on, on such a commission that we're all actively voicing um, a support, the support for this and that it's needed here in San Jose. Um, the next thing is accountability. You know, we have to have zero tolerance uh, for police officers who commit racist actions. We can't just, that can be just something that's laughed off or, or something that, you know, someone may need to just apologize for. It has to be something that, you know, we, we make harsh decisions because we, we can, we need to show that our solidarity means that, you know, we can't accept you know, such racist actions against anyone in our community because we all are one community and, and it matters that that we're all you know feel comfortable in our space and finally the the cycle needs to be broken you know our city should not be okay with the assaults and deaths by the hands of the police you know we, we really need to consider like the hiring preferences given to those one not only for stellar past but are raised locally that happens by you know really getting out there in our communities and getting people to getting good people to be raised with a good education, getting people to be out in our communities and really raising those people to become part of the police force instead of those who know nothing about our communities coming in here um, and really feeling they know what is best and, and not really caring about our communities. We have to be very vocal about this, very vocal about, very vocal about who's getting hired. And if we're not happy with that person getting hired, that our voice be heard around that as well. And, and we also urge the community to adopt recommendations that move away from the carceral system and invest in programs that better assist the rehabilitation of induced facilities and waste. So when we're thinking about mental health programs, when we're thinking about the root causes of police violence, so things like poverty, things like gentrification, you know, it, we, we need to really start thinking outside of the box. And if we really start thinking about this idea of, of black wealth building that can really solve a lot as it pertains to the police um, feeling like they need to enter into our neighborhoods and, and really um, do whatever they want to our community. So we really need to, need, need to consider all these things as we're, as we're thinking about, you know, how do we move forward? How do we live in a community where black people feel safe where Black people want to stay here in San Jose, because um, currently we're trending in the wrong direction. And it, and it takes an entire community uh, to really be able to come together and make these changes. This isn't just a Black issue. This is an all of us issue. Um, so we really want you know, to work with everyone um, as we come together and try to make much needed change in our community. Um, so I want to go to the next slide. Um, where we can just have um, some some discussion on a few questions we have. Um, we don't have to um, talk about them in any particular order. Um, but you know, how do we prevent the deaths of Black people by the police? And what practices need to change to create a safer environment when the police approach our Black population? And who should be in charge of holding the police accountable for their actions? Um, we're open to having a discussion with all of you. We really want to know your opinion on this thing. Thank you. Yes, Jamal. 
What's up, everybody? I really didn't want to be first, so Tarab, you should have raised your hand yeah, just yeah, a second sure. earlier. So um, I really appreciate you all uh, doing this presentation, yeah, and for sharing your uh, experience and everybody sharing their experience and being honest. Um, can you put the questions back up? Uh, just so I can remember them. Um, I think that you all gave a, a, a lot of information that really touched on the questions here. And one thing I'm, you know, one thing I find interesting is this is while we're San Jose committee, this is really a, a nationwide discussion. And every um, every answer from municipalities has been the same. Um, and so we're seeing the same issues. <laughs> And I really think that we can be bold, like you said, Levere. We can we can really think outside the box. Um, and so, so, so the question I think, with the first the first question, is really looking at how we're resourcing our our black communities. And we know that in our city, as with other cities, as with our country, a majority of our city's budget goes to law enforcement. Um, and criminal yeah. justice, and that's just a that's just a backwards approach to how we do things. Um, if we're if we're being honest, that the reason why we have the inequity that we have is because people don't have the opportunities and the resources. Yeah. So I think I think that the, the first way to prevent is to is to resource our community. And when we think about practices, um, and and I think kind of the second two kind of go hand in hand. Is we always talk about like you know we pay taxes, yeah. For so sure. it's well, our money supporting exactly. law enforcement. We really need to see a, a say in um, from like, citizens, from community, in what they want their uh, public safety officers to look like, not, to act, um, and and how yeah. they, how they should be held accountable. And we don't have that. We don't have a system. To real, for citizens to really hold um, uh, public officials accountable and public servants yeah, accountable. And, ACE, and that should be us here, but, yeah, since it are, is yeah, our money that goes into doing that. Um, and unfortunately, the, the, the lowest resources commu resource communities have the least amount of say, um, which is why it's well, like Matt Mahan can come out and say what he says when he's not all impacted. By, by, by police and by criminal justice system. So, so I think I think you all really hit a lot of the points. And I, I appreciate um, you know being able to work with y'all on this. Thank you. Thank you, Jamal. Rob. Hello, everyone. This is Rob Ansari here, uh, representing the Behavioral Health Contractors Association of Santa Clara County. Uh, first of all, thank you to Kiana. Uh, for your lived experience. Uh, that was really powerful. Um, I was also there the same day during those protests. And I, and I, I know the feeling of, of the kind of the burning feeling that it gave to some inside that things need to change. Uh, so I had two comments uh, for how we can kind of change things. One was related to Kiana's uh, talk about how police use force. What I noticed was that Police always use the, they, they'll make a uh, noticing that this is now uh, no, no longer a, you know, a public gathering. And then once they do that, immediately it's, it's deploying, you know, escalating, right? It, it's like, it's as though once they make that notice that this is no longer a legal public gathering, that they then have, you know, the license to like escalate and then and start using, you know, on militarized munitions such as the one shown in these videos. So I think, you know, somehow making sure that that response is more measured and that once they declare it an unlawful gathering, it's not a license for them to escalate, but, you know, they still have to engage in de-escalation. Um, and I think it, it's obvious that even just because they, you know, you, you call something unlawful doesn't mean it's, you know, you can't disregard the fact, you know, the context of the situation. Um, and so I think that needs to change there and maybe just, you know, something this committee could think about about is there a way to rein in that power uh, or at least, you know, give it some kind of oversight. And then that oversight ties into, you know, how do we prevent deaths of black people by the police? And I think community oversight is the answer to that. 
Um, I personally sat through the, the meetings uh, given by Commissioner Magnolia at the Charter Commission review meeting. And so, you know, that that model made sense to me, the, the model of having this form of oversight that, you know, allows you to have civilian input at the highest level. Um, I don't see the point of having input lower than that. And that's what some people seem to have an issue about when it comes to the politics. But really, if you're you got to change the attitude from the top down. And so I think having a civilian oversight from the top down is what makes sense and will prevent some of these fatal encounters. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions or comments uh, before we close? Hi, Lori. Hi. I want to tell um, Kiana and Derek, thank you for having the courage to share what you guys have been through. I'm sorry you guys had to live through that. I personally couldn't go out to the protest when that happened because I was afraid I was going to see what I saw. And since I'm a single parent, now I would have my kids by me. And I didn't want to have them more traumatized. But every day I live with the fear when somebody goes out and talks against or protests against police violence, especially some of the young people in my community that I've established a relationship with who have, you know, been, who have met me and my children. I'm, I'm afraid that something will happen to you guys, you know, and it's not a good feeling to live in fear of people you care about in our community. And that's one thing the officers seem to forget. How would you want the way you want your moms, your sisters, your brothers, your wives to be treated? That's the way you should be treating the community you serve. You should never forget that you are not better, that they are not better than us. They are the same. Without that uniform, they are the same. They bleed the same like us. They have families who will grieve for them because if they commit suicide, because cops aren't killed that much in San Jose by community members, they are killing themselves. They are harming themselves. And only 13 officers have ever died in the line of duty here in San Jose. And that's throughout the history of San Jose's um, beginning, you know, but I want to um, say that, and one way that we have to make sure is that we need to keep making sure that people that are impacted are sitting at these decision-making tables, that the voices unheard, like my son, Josiah, that we should put the children's voices at the forefront because this is his future. If he lives with this trauma and this fear for the rest of his life, what is he going to grow up to be? What? Always looking over his back, always being feel like he has to watch his back and then him running and, and he gets killed because the cops assume he did something because he's a brown kid, not because they know anything about him, not because they know his trauma. And this is what we face. What we need to do is start investing Take away money for the police. They get so much of the money when we could better be using it to make housing for the homeless, but our education, why do we keep on taking money from our education, from our children? Our most vulnerable in our community don't have the resources to do the things that they need to do to bring healing to them into their schools, to give them opportunities to thrive and to be able to be successful. We're forgetting about that. Instead, we're just making it harder for some of these kids to even accomplish and be successful in school. We're sending them to continuation schools, which is a feed to the school to prison pipeline. And unless officers, the officers, this is what needs to happen. Every officer who has killed somebody, we talk about restorative justice, how we'll put the, the victim and, and the person who does it in front of each other to do that. When will an officer ever who killed somebody sit across the table from a family 
and hear what the family is going through so they can understand the impact that it has on the family. And just because it's happened to us doesn't mean like nowhere has anybody can ever say that I say F the police or this and that. You know what? I don't see it like that. I'm disgusted with the behavior because that behavior is a model. These are supposed to be people that kids look up to. They're the sickest and they're the worst model, role models that I want my son to look up to. Because in his head, he thinks if you become a cop, you could go around killing people. He has, he's 12 now and he has so much anger. And it hurts me because I don't want him having that mentality. It's not okay to kill people just because you have the permission by your little shiny badge. And so the community, you guys, the community need to stay strong and listen, listen to those impacted. Don't let the city government leaders say, oh, we're going to make these um, advisory committees, these uh, community oversight, and then they put the people they want there. They can't be putting the people because they're always, this is why we are where we are. The same people are always on these things and we get nowhere. The ones who are impacted should be at the forefront, period. We should have the say. Because nowhere in the world do you see a child rapist, a pedophile. He's not on the decision-making table of how do you how do you um, prosecute him or how much time he gets in jail, right? So why is it that the police and the police associations always get to sit at those tables when it comes down to prosecuting or making policies or anything has to do with them? It should be the same rule across. It has to be fair across. But see, nobody sees that. And we need to start opening our eyes. We can't let the police, the police unions and all them make the rules on how we hold them accountable. It can't happen. It's never gonna get anywhere that way. And our city leaders need to start waking up or we need to get rid of them all because so far they just continue to allow this to happen. They're not doing anything to change it and there's lives that are being destroyed. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie. Sandra. Hi, good morning. I'm Sandra Asher. I am was nominated to represent the disability community. And uh, again, want to thank our presenters for sharing their experience today. And a couple of thoughts I have is regarding how I think overall what we're talking about is how do we change a culture within the department, right? How do we change we know that the implicit bias training hasn't worked um, because it really hasn't changed the culture. So I think the key question is what sort of actions create cultural change within an organization? And to that end, um, are we looking at what gets rewarded within the department? Who gets promoted? Who gets accolades? Are we giving those rep those that recognition to officers who are exemplary in keeping our community safe um, and serving versus those who are um, have discharged their weapon and killed a community member, right? Who is taking people into custody safely, treating people with respect? And are we rewarding those behaviors within the department and promoting those individuals into leadership positions? Um, and to, again, along with that, what gets measured? How are we measuring performance? What statistics are we keeping? Are we measuring the positive things that officers do and promoting that? And then also measuring um, outcomes from discipline, outcomes from issues, and what happens down the line? So when we have officers who have repeatedly killed in the line of duty, how are we approaching those officers and their and looking at the cause of that and what has put them in that position and then also how can they act differently in the future and if they're not going to act differently in the future then why are they still part of our department right are we rewarding people that are being safe and treating our community with respect or are we rewarding a culture in the department that puts our population at risk so those are my thoughts thank you Thank you, Sandra. Darcy? 
Hey, good morning. Thank you all so much for this presentation. Um, it was very powerful and I'm very moved by it. And I think um, many things stood out to me, but one of the things I wanted to highlight was Kiana's comment around policing just not being the most effective way to, to handle these matters. It's not the most effective way to address crime. Um, we, I, I don't know who mentioned it earlier, but we also know that crime is a moving target, right? What we consider to be illegal or a crime changes. So in this, in this committee, we've talked a lot about addressing harm and violence rather than addressing crime. And I think these discussion questions that are here um, up for us to review are really important. And this committee owes um, the community represented by the presenters today answers to these questions through the policy recommendations that we recommend. And I, I, I'm wondering if the three committees that are looking and presenting are going to bring back drafts of policy recommendations can, can put those recommendations through the lens of these discussion questions and really ask ourselves as we're moving forward policy recommendations, are we addressing these questions that are brought up today? Because these are not, these questions are not unlike um, questions that have come up for other demographics that have spoken or presented to this, to this group. And another consistent theme that continues to come up in each of these meetings is the most effective way to handle communities feeling unsafe, the most effective way to deal with harm and violence in the community. And we pretty consistently have come to the conclusion that policing is just not the most effective way to address crime. So I'm, I, I hope that we can start to, as we narrow down our policy recommendations, start to think about how are we building safe communities? How are we as a community addressing violence and harm? And also as, as a committee that's going to be um, submitting recommendations to the city, to our city leaders um, and recommendations of what they can do with city funds, are we really using city funds in the most effective way to create a safer city for us all? And it's pretty clear that we're not. Um, and so even taking out the, the personalities and even taking out, um, you know, addressing culture, addressing those things, I think there's still a really important um, argument to be made that even if you remove all of those more human-based notions, it just, there is no data that supports that this is this is effective and maybe we can be searching for a more effective way to make sure all people feel welcomed in our city and that we are addressing crime and harm thank you Darcy. um and just so everyone knows i'm stepping in for levere for facilitating the rest of the meeting um so jamal yeah i I always appreciate going after Darcy. She's a beast. I, I kind of echoing what she what she said um, is that I th I think that um, if you ask if you if you ask a lot of uh, if you ask the black community what they feel like they need, some people might say they need more police, more policing, more safety. Um, but I think, you know, when, when, when we talked to, um, we had a conversation with Lieutenant Governor of Michigan, Garland Gilkers, the second, we asked him this question, he put it really plainly. And he was like, yo, close your eyes and envision the safest, the safest place, you know, you can envision in your life. Who's a part of that vision? Are police a part of that vision? And most people would say no. Right, most people who envision the safest place don't see police in their vision. What they see are resources. What they see is community support. What they see is jobs. What they see is health. What they see are good schools that are teaching their children. And too often we, 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 we only see, the only answer we come up with is police and more police and more harsh and harsher penalties is because that's what's always been done. But like Darcy, like Darcy said, we have, we have data and we have stats to show that that doesn't work. And we also have data and stats and information to show that it doesn't work for black people. And we have that information to show even in a city where we're 3%, right? We can look at the numbers of the incarcerated people in our jail currently it tied up in our legal system currently and our unhoused population. 
and we're getting the, the, the worst end of the stick as Black people. And, and if the answer, we only, the only answer we come up with is nicer police, better trained police. That's the, we're not trying, we're not trying. And I don't, I don't have any ill um, will towards individual police or officers as people. But we have to understand that this institution isn't working. And so I think what will happen is we're going to put some recommendations out. We're going to get a lot of pushback from people who don't understand those of us that are being harmed in our communities that are being harmed. And we just got to keep fighting. And we're going to get a lot of pushback from a city council that's, that's, that's scared and conservative and doesn't want to actually take chances in this, in this realm. And we're going to keep fighting and keep pushing because we know and we have information and data that shows us that this is not working for our communities. Um, so I, I think we, we all want to be clear about that. And I want to say that to whoever's listening, that, that nicer police, better trained police isn't the answer. And it's not the vision we have of safety. So appreciate, appreciate y'all listening. Thank you for that, Jamal. We've got Sandra, Sparky, and then Lori. Uh, this is Sandra. Um, yeah, thank you, Jamal and Darcy, for your comments here, both spot on as, as always. And I just wanted to echo a point about the accountability um, and the question of holding the police accountable for their actions. I also sat in on the Charter Commission discussions um, and have spoken with Commissioner Magnolia uh, Siegel extensively. And um, I truly believe things will not change unless there is better oversight and accountability. Um, because right now there is none. The um, current structure allows for recommendations, but there's really no teeth um, to our structure, current accountability structure. So I think um, having recommendations and pushing the politicians and the city council to really think about putting in stronger oversight um, and the changing the system that um, holds our officers and institutions accountable to the people um, is vital if we're going to make change. And um, additionally, focusing on um, the root causes of crime, because I fully agree with Darcy that police do not solve crime, they react to crime. And in order to have a safer community, um, we need to be addressing those root causes um, with services, um, with building up our community um, and putting investment there um, in order to have a safer and more equitable society. That's all, thank you. Hi, Kiana. Good to see you there. Um, yeah, I appreciate what everybody's been saying, and it sort of reinforces kind of work we've been doing at Bill Wilson Center for the last 40 years. And I wanted to approach it a little differently, which is from an agency perspective, too, as a nonprofit working with homeless and quote gang impacted youth you know whatever terms we use for many many years downtown we've had many many interactions with various police departments and san jose pd in particular has been very challenging especially for our african-american staff and kids and just as an example yesterday we were talking about needing to power wash one of our buildings to be painted. And my facility manager, who's African-American, was saying he didn't want to do that because last time he did that, the police came into our downtown site and basically said because of the draft, he wasn't supposed to be doing that. Now, I don't know if that's normal for police departments to be going into private residents and, and challenging them regarding using too much water, but have to understand that this is what my African-American staff get constantly and our kids as far as their interaction with police. And I must say as an agency, um, our interaction with police has been less than stellar at times. 
Um, and I would like to talk about how we improve those relationships. Um, we really need to sit down and have these conversations, not just with me and the police, but with my African American staff to kind of and our clients so that you understand what they're feeling too. I don't know if it will change anything, but we have to do something because after 40 years, it's pretty exhausting and it hasn't changed. So just my comments. Thank you. Is it my turn, Kiana? Yes. Thank you, Sparky, for saying that. Yes, those conversations need to be had. I just wanted to throw out there for our community, don't don't believe in the smoke screens that the city leaders are giving you that, oh, we have body cameras so we can hold them accountable because if the police are having control of these videos, then that's not holding them accountable because they can do whatever they say, they can redact, they could do whatever. Also, the Black Lives Matter little sign that Mayor Licardo put up um, after the George Floyd protest and trying to say Black Lives Matter. You could say Black Lives Matter. Every, every person who said you could say Black Lives Matter, but if you can't acknowledge the people who are killed in your own city, then you're a fake. And that Black Lives Matter sign, it's a disrespect to all the lives who were taken here in San Jose, whose names do not appear on that. He put names from other states everywhere, and that's a disrespect because he couldn't even acknowledge the lives that were taken in his own backyard, his city. So, you know, people need to pay attention to that. Him putting up that sign, Black Lives Matter, didn't mean shit. And I'm sorry I said it, but it doesn't mean shit because he couldn't even acknowledge the two black men who were killed in San Jose on that sign. Thanks. Thank you, Lori. Ihoma? Thank you. Um, hopefully you can hear me. I just wanted to thank everyone for a really wonderful presentation and vulnerable sharing. And my comment is simply that what is really needed is transparency. We heard a lot of the reporting and stories and statistics, but most of the public does not have a lot of this commonly available. And so um, I think some of the recommendations need to be geared towards transparency, geared towards making sure that the public who are employing the police, who are um, suffering the effects of police negligence or violence, um, that they are able to see what exactly is happening with police, what is happening with the train, what is happening in terms of what percentage of those um, arrests result in convictions and how many are wrongful convictions. All of this must be information transparently available. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have further questions or comment? Yes, James. Uh, thank you. I just like to also uh, echo several of my colleagues' uh, statements and thanking uh, the presenters uh, who presented their side of the story and. Uh, Thank you, Kiana, for your contributions. Uh, I continue you know, to attend these meetings because I continue to learn. I'm uh, on the Neighborhoods Commission, and the Neighborhoods Commission represents neighbors from across the city. And public safety is one of our biggest, or is one of our four main focus points. And in dealing with public safety, we hear things from all, par all parts of the city, from all jurisdictions and from all neighbors that have been impacted by uh, mainly a lack of public safety. So this is really a focus of our group. And so public safety and policing really is a, affects everyone from across the city. And it's the actions that really need to be taken into account of what the police are doing or not doing being active or inactive. So yes, it's a culture that needs to be changed. And it's real nice to say that their attitudes need to change, but it's their actions that really affect the, our neighbors across the city. And to 
take away some funds or to contribute some funds or additional funds may or may not be effective, but it's the actions and the contributions of those funds and where they go will really affect what actions we all take. So, you know, thank you again and thank you for your contributions. And as I stated at the beginning, when I started to talk, I continued to learn. So thank you. Thank you. Before we go to our last speaker, uh, Rosa, well, that's what I wanted to say, that Rosa will be our last speaker. We do have to continue on with the rest of our agenda, which include our committee reports and whatnot. So I just wanted to say that real quick. And Rosa, please go ahead. Hola, buenos días a todos. Este, uh, hay que mantener eh, los ojos abiertos, este, no nomás para el caso de la policía, sino este, cualquier otro tipo de injusticia que haya también sobre la vivienda y tantos problemas que tenemos. Este, uh, en el caso de la gente de color, dicen pues que hay mucha discriminación y sí la hay, pero también con nosotros los hispanos también hay discriminación. Este, estoy muy feliz, entre comillas, por el caso de Roger Aguilera, que es el trailero en Colorado que se le habían dado 110 años este, de prisión por el accidente que tuvo, pero es injusto porque como a los otros jóvenes o a la gente que asesina, a la gente blanca, este, no se le juzga por, por lo que hacen este matar matar a ahora sí que en las escuelas este sus sus delitos sus mm, consecuencias no las miran ellos tan graves como si fuera una persona de color o un hispano porque entonces ahí sí arremeten contra ellos y con todo el poder este entonces uh, para mí este que le hayan reducido la condena a 10 años este me pareció justo o injusto porque tal vez lo debían de ver este eh, reducido a, al tiempo que ya tiene él en la cárcel entonces este hay que mantenernos unidos porque la unión hace la fuerza y que el, la policía sí si hace también comete delitos, este pues también se le debe de juzgar, juzgar por lo que hayan hecho, no nomás porque es un policía, este se le, se le exonere de cualquier delito. Este es todo, mi, este es mi comentario, gracias por darme el espacio y feliz año para todos. Kiana. Yes. Can I come, can I comment to Rosa real quick in Spanish? Sure. And Rosa, muchas gracias por decir lo que dijiste, porque quiero decirte la problema con la la eh, comunidad hispana es que estamos impuestos de no hablar. Si no hablas como como los padres, you know, no traigas problemas y todo eso. Y eso también nosotros tenemos que cambiar eso en nuestra comunidad hispana. Porque yo sé que uh, en San José hay muchas um, familias hispanos que dicen, pues eso ya ha pasado, ya hace mucho tiempo, siempre lo hacen igual y nadie no hace nada para qué hablar, ¿verdad? So es entonces para lo, nosotros que queremos cambiar las cosas aquí, de, eh, de informar a la comunidad, tenemos que unir, tenemos que hablar, no dejar que estos delitos se están haciendo Cada vez no más porque somos mexicanos creen que somos pendejos, ¿verdad? So es nuestra obligación como hispano com comunidad también de, de informarlos, de no decir porque los policías van a, a veces los policías van a las comunidades hispanos que no más hablan español para hacer el papel que oh sí los apoyamos y todo eso cuando ellos los no están matando más que nada en San José. So es como nosotros, como usted que estás aquí, si sí, lo que le pasó a ese muchacho era muy grave, porque él no tenía culpa de eso, era la compañía que no arregló el, el troca bien. Pero eso es lo que pasa aquí también. Los delitos que hace uno no se les cobra igual a cada persona. Si eres persona de color es diferente, si eres un gringo eres diferente. Pero gracias de estar aquí y, y a ver si podemos hablar más, yo tú 
y las otras mujeres que son um, que hablan español para juntarnos nosotros para yo poder ayudarles y para ver cómo comentar para ayudar la, la comunidad hispana aquí en San José. I'm not too sure what you said, Lori. The interpretation is not on, but thank you very much. And um, Chris, can we put up the other slides and we'll just get through uh, the rest of the meeting. And I do apologize that we have gone overboard on our time. I know you all are very busy and you have other meetings to attend to. So let's just go through um, these remaining slides. So um, the first one is the steering committee update. Um, Chris, would you like to speak to this? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you all for giving me this time. Um, just want to remind of everyone the timeline. Uh, we do realize uh, uh, that right now we are on the home stretch. Our goal is to have some finalized uh, recommendations by the end of March so that the um, count city council will have time to take action on them before they take their break in June. Um, and so, uh, as you can see, we were hoping to get our recommendations in by the end of the year. Of course, it's a very busy time. And so we're asking that uh, we have those recommendations done by January 15th um, so that we can take them to our various um, organizations and constituencies for their feedback. Um, so I say all that to say, please pay attention to your email for the subcommittee meetings because um, uh, those subcommittees will need your support, particularly the next 10 days. Um, if the subcommittee time doesn't uh, work with your schedule, please communicate that with those who are facilitating those meetings so that um, we, we might be able to change those times or, uh, you know, we can find another way to collaborate. Um, but uh, we will need your support the next 10 days to get those recommendations done so we can move forward with the process. Thank you. Um, is there anything else for the steering committee? Can you go to the next slide, please, Chris? Um, is there any report from the promotion and prevention subcommittee? If so, please raise your hand. Okay, um, I'm gonna assume that's a no for now. Can we go to the next one? Is there any um, update for the Police Accountability and Reform Subcommittee? Yes, Sandra, Sandra, Sandra please. Hi, um, I just wanted to share that we uh, did meet this last Monday and have several meetings scheduled over uh, the coming week and a half to um, work together on finalizing or finalizing the drafts, I should say, of our recommendations uh, to meet the uh, 15th deadline. Thank you. Chris, can we go to the next slide, please? We have one more report from the last committee. Um, is this a majority changer? I don't know. Uh, I'm, I get the names confused, so I, sometimes I forget. But is anyone else from the last um, subcommittee? The alternative subcommittee, yes. Yeah. We don't have a, a report at this time. Thank you. Um, thank you, appreciate that. Okay, um, the final um, agendized item on this meeting is to accept public comment. So if any members of the public would like to give comment, please raise your hand at this time. I see Rips um, has her hand raised. Um, you, uh, you may unmute now and speak. The 
if you're, if you're trying to provide comment, you'll need to hit up. There you go. Yeah. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, I am uh, in San Diego this week, just checking out the wonders of uh, San Diego. Uh, so it's a good topic today. Uh, I'm interested in how African-American culture down here in San Diego, how that could maybe be connected to uh, what takes place in San Jose. Um, it's an interesting area. Uh, I hope the, uh, the, the committee process, the commission process, there's gonna be an equity round table and there's going to be uh, the COVID economic forum commission going on. Uh, I hope you guys are making good connections to those groups and that possibly the, uh, the uh, city charter process can be able to continue uh, a little bit longer uh, to work on uh, legal language issues. Uh, if I can get some sort of report back from that, that would be really nice. Uh, but if you can't, that's okay too. And just to quickly comment to conclude, uh, the words of a uh, uh, previous person, about, it was a really good lecture today. Thanks. The previous words, uh, I, I, I'm like understanding better what, what Mayhan's doing and going through. And, uh, you know, I, I, I hope we can learn how to just quiet, just politely convince him that there's other terms to use besides what he's doing. Uh, there's a whole new system of uh, law enforcement and surveillance technology going on. If you notice right now, we really have to consider the term as reimagine and really double down on what good uh, equity pack, racial equity practices and reimagine practices uh, towards help and human services to be at this time. And if we really harp on that on them, I think we can make some gains because they're coming in hard with the law enforcement stuff right now. I think we can bring back really good returns uh, with our end. So good luck in how we work uh, this, this next few months. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would anyone else from the public like to give comment? Please raise your hand now. Hi, this is Blair. Can I just quickly conclude or clarify that uh, the entire Bay Area seems to be going through this uh, law enforcement kick right now and uh, good luck how we can uh, do really good ideas of reimagine to counter that. Thank you. If no one else would like to give public comment, I move to adjourn today's meeting. Second. Okay. Well, we have decided to move on from today's meeting. Thank you all so much for being here.